This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of 2 Timothy, and we'll be reading chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light and through the gospel. One of the things that's hard for me to grasp sometimes is, number one, how much God loves us. What He's done because we have not loved Him. We have not lived as people who please God. But God in His love and mercy and wisdom in the text that Will just read to us, had a plan for our spiritual problem before time began. Because He knew what we would do. And because He knew what we would do, He had already planned to take care of our greatest need, and that's forgiveness. In Romans chapter 8, 5 and verse 12, the scripture tells us that sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death means separation. Sin fundamentally means to miss the mark or to transgress God's law. 1 John 3 and verse 4 says sin is transgression of the law or lawlessness, depending on your translation. I want you to move back with me in time to probably the saddest chapter in all the Bible, and it's the third chapter of Genesis where Satan tempts Eve, Adam there in her presence gives in to the temptation that Satan sets before them, eating of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is dead serious about sin. He's very serious about His will being done. And he made it very clear that the day that they ate of that fruit, that they would die. And because they did, they did die. Death came into the world because the scripture would, again, from Romans 5, 12, says sin entered the world. One commentator I looked at recently pointed out the fact that sin was already a reality because Satan comes along and he introduces it. But it's through man that sin entered the world. Obviously, Satan had sinned in heaven. Regardless of what we understand of what he was before, he rebelled against God. Obviously, there's no redemption for the devil. And so he has spent his time trying to bring people to himself and to his way and pull them away from God. But sin entered the world. And because sin came into the world, God had said to Mother Eve that the pain of childbearing would be multiplied. And that Adam would have to work harder. The toiling of his work, his labor, would be more difficult. That the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles. Sin not only causes separation from God, which it did, but it also makes life harder It doesn't make things easier. It may appear so, but in the long run, it makes things more difficult. So God drove Adam and Eve from their beautiful garden home. Life became very difficult. I would say the second, maybe the second saddest chapter, at least in Genesis, is in the fourth chapter. 
where Cain rises and kills his own brother. Now, sin has come into the world and death through sin, but nobody has died physically yet. I want you to put yourself, if you can, just a moment in Eve's place and you're, you're holding the lifeless, perhaps very bloody body of your second-born child and your firstborn has killed him. How would you feel? Well, it's probably difficult to know. Adam is standing here looking on, thinking, what what happened here? And they've never seen death before. Maybe, Maybe in animals, but not in people. So sin is an ugly thing. It's a horrible thing. And it does nothing but bring heartache and and problems into our world. But God in His wisdom and His love before time began had had a plan to take care of our problem. Because you see, not only did Adam and Eve sin and not only did Cain sin... In Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, the scripture says that the whole world is seen to be guilty before God. We're in a damned state, a condemned state. So we need help. Today, a lot of people are thinking about Jesus and his resurrection, and it's an important thing to think about. You take the resurrection out of the gospel and you just remove a very important part of, of what's going on with God's teaching. But I also want you to remember Genesis chapter 3 and, and verse 15. God says to the woman, or with regard to the woman, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, or your offspring and your offspring. Speaking to the devil, pardon me. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. This is the first gospel message, the Proto-Evangelium. It is the first time that a plan for taking care of man's sin has been mentioned, that God is going to take care of our problem. We know that Satan bruised the heel of Jesus, and many believe that's a reference to perhaps the, the nails on the cross going into the heel of our Lord. But you know that Jesus, after he was taken from the cross and put in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, on the third day, he came forth alive. He defeated what Satan introduced. He defeated the results of what Satan introduced. He defeated sin and he defeated death. That which Satan set in motion and that which man allowed to come into the world, Jesus solved by his death and his resurrection. But I want you to think, to go back in time quickly, that you go back and Eve may be thinking, well, who's going to fulfill this promise that, to take care of this problem that sin has caused and what Satan has introduced to us? Did she process this passage in her mind? You have to remember the rest of the story has not been written. The rest of the story of life and history of man has not occurred. Maybe she thought she could have thought, well, maybe Abel would take care of this because Jesus called Abel a prophet. He gets his name in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith in his offering. Maybe she thought that Abel would fulfill the promise given here. Well, of course, we know that that he didn't. And and one of the reasons we know that is because his brother killed him. Then you move down a little further in time and you read about a man named Enoch. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24 that Enoch walked with God. Maybe people thought someone like Enoch might fulfill this promise to to crush or bruise the head of Satan. Maybe he would solve this problem, but we know that he was not for, for God took him. 
Then you go into Genesis chapter 6 and you read about a man by the name of, of Noah. The Bible says that Lamech, who was Noah's father, said when Noah was born, said this one will give us rest or comfort from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Did Lamech think that maybe Noah would fulfill this promise that was given to to Eve and Adam and the curse that was pronounced on Satan that maybe Noah would be the one? And and especially, you know, we, we look at the situation with his life. The Bible says in Genesis 6 and verse 9 that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in all his generation. Well, did they think Noah might fulfill this promise to to answer the problem of sin? Then you move to Genesis chapter 11 and you find people trying to build a tower to God and you might start raising the question, well, it seems like it's not going to be answered. Somebody noted recently that from Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11 covers 2,000 years of human history. And then the next major event in chapter 12 is Abraham. And from Abraham to Revelation, 2,000 years of human history. The Bible basically covers 4,000 years of human history. What did God say in Genesis 12 to Abraham? Well, he made a promise to him that, that through him and his offspring, many nations would be blessed. Maybe people started to think, well, finally this promise is going to be fulfilled and somebody that's born from from Abraham, we really don't have people saying this, but you have to wonder, who would fulfill this? When would this happen? Well, you know, Abram and Sarah were very old when God talked to them about having this child that would be born to them in their old age, and it was obviously a miracle that it happened. And you remember that Ishmael was born because they got too impatient with the situation, but he was not the son of promise. The son of promise was Isaac. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph and all that generation of people. And you think, what did God say to him through him and his offspring? His seed, many nations of the earth would be blessed. Regardless of what people were thinking, we're seeing God's plan begin to unfold here. That he had a plan. When you read those genealogies in the Old Testament, don't you dare get bored. Those genealogies are there for a very powerful spiritual reason. Especially when you read the Gospel of Matthew. You begin with Abraham. And, of course, Matthew was a gospel written to the Jewish people. He began with Abraham. They really believed in Abraham. And he talks about David all the way down to Joseph, the physical father of Jesus. We know God fathered him through the Holy Spirit. But genealogically speaking, and then you read Luke's account, Luke chapter 3, you have the genealogy Uh, that comes down to Mary and it goes all the way back to Adam who Luke says was the son of God because Adam was made by God. Those genealogical records are there for a reason to trace the the genealogy all the way back and, and to prove that whoever was born to Mary and the man who was married to her by the name of Joseph was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to Abraham. Well, you know that he made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Isaac. And he made that covenant with with no one else. And then you come down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. What about Jacob's sons? And you have Joseph. And then, then you have Judah. What does the Bible say about Judah? With regard to Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49 and verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, 
From which tribe did Jesus come? The tribe of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Go back and look at how Matthew begins his genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, talking about Abraham and David. And and then you look at Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4. I've made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now you move forward to Isaiah chapter 6, rather 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. All the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. But how is this going to happen, Isaiah? Well, we know it's obviously talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. And how was Jesus born? You look at the genealogy, but you also look at the spiritual side of it. That Joseph was not Jesus' physical father, except in the sense that he filled the role of a father. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, his mother was a virgin. In Isaiah 7, 14, a sign will be given. The virgin, oh, the virgin will be with child. They're going to call his name Emmanuel. Wasn't that fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23? Emmanuel, born of this virgin, Mary. We've read the story. God with us. I want you to pause for a moment and think. In the beginning, God gave Adam and Eve one command. They violated it. But God had a plan for that problem. Yes, you're going to have to leave the garden. And yes, life's going to be hard. And, and yes, maybe their sin is what initiated what happened with Cain. Who knows? The story details are not given to us as how their family life was. We just don't know. We do not know, know that Abel offered sacrifices to God. And we understand the conflict. But how Adam and Eve and were with their children, the Bible really doesn't say but sin came into the world and it created problems and the major problem that it causes is separation that's what death is separation from God Isaiah tells us that the virgin would be born and call his name Emmanuel God with us And then you go back and you read those genealogies in Matthew and Luke. And you see how, you know what's interesting to me? Around AD 70, Titus raised the temple of Jerusalem. Do you know one of the key things that he destroyed in that temple? Were all the genealogical records of the Jews. There's not a Jew today who can can give you his genealogy unless he goes back like we do in ours, but he cannot connect himself to anyone from that time period. And isn't it interesting, when you do have the genealogical records in Matthew and Luke, they stop at Jesus. There's a reason for that. God accomplished what he said he would do through the offspring or the seed of woman, finally bringing Jesus into the world. Where was Jesus born? Well, we read in the Gospel accounts, he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Micah prophesied this in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But you, Bethlehem of Phratha, there were two Bethlehems. This one was very small and very specific. 
But you, Micah 5, 2 again, but you, Bethlehem of Phratha, through you, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, there's your connection to Judah again, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. What did John say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 1 through 3, in chapter, verse 14 of John chapter 1. Jesus has not always been, but the Word has. When He was born, they gave Him the name Savior. That's what Jesus means. He also was the Christ, the Anointed One, or the Messiah, depending on which language that you choose. Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek, the anointed one. Well, whose son is he then? I love these kinds of studies because I'm going to tell you something. I need to know who Jesus is. I need to know when I stand and confess him anywhere who I'm talking about. I believe that he is eternal. I believe He's the Son of God without question. I believe that He lived, regardless of some of the modern day critics. Jesus lived. We have four accounts of gospel records that attest to that fact. Jesus not only was born, but He lived. But He asked the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were all gathered together. I'm in Matthew 22, verses 41 and following. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying... What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. You see, they knew. They knew who the Christ would come from. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? What? Oh, that's Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. How, how, does, how does he do that? If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? You know, the Pharisees couldn't answer that. And it's not because it was complicated. It's because they hadn't been listening to Jesus all along. That's another hint, powerful hint of the deity of Christ. David said 1,000 years before Jesus was born, the Lord said to my Lord, ultimately from his offspring, the Lord Jesus would come. The Messiah would come. And he would take care of, of our problem. We read the gospel accounts. And it's a wonderful thing to do. I like to read McGarvey's fourfold gospel. McGarvey's fourfold gospel is a work J.W. McGarvey did, and he took all the gospels and put them in what he understood to be chronological order. And it's a wonderful way to study the gospel accounts. And I think you can buy it now. It, it's, uh, you might be able to get it electronically, I'm not sure. But to, and watch from the time that John introduces Jesus and his life all the way through. Well, finally... The Jews got the Romans to kill him. And brethren, I don't care. I know he's alive. But that was a horrible thing that happened to our Lord. To be put to death as he was. To be treated as a common criminal. To be treated as garbage. To be put on a garbage hill. A place where criminals were killed. That's where they took our Lord. God's promise was true and it was fulfilled in His birth and His life. The place of His birth is very specific. And His death. What about this death? What does Isaiah have to say some 700 years before Jesus was born? In the 53rd chapter, who has believed what He has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young or tender plant 
and like a root out of dry ground. He has no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. Matter of fact, Isaiah says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that brought about peace was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see, watch this, there's a transition. Watch this. Listen to what God said to Abraham. From your seed, many nations of the earth will be blessed. For he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore I will appoint him a portion with the great and divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes... Intercession for the transgressors. How could he make transgress make intercession for the transgressors? Well, you read the end of the gospel accounts, and you find that Jesus is alive after three days. That is the crushing blow to the head of Satan who brought sin and death into this world. Jesus is alive never to die again and he wants to pass that same life that he's brought to us on to us he wants to give us that opportunity when Jesus disciples when you read in the first chapter of the book of Acts that we we find that There's a discussion between the Lord and His apostles. He's died, He's been buried, He's been resurrected. He has spent 40 days with these men before He sends them into all the world. In verse 6 of Acts 1, it says, When they come together, they ask Him, Lord, will You at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking, and we're looking for an earthly kingdom because that's what they thought would be fulfilled in God's promise to David. You remember what Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not a world, it's not an earthly kingdom. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to all the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go in to heaven. And then you move over into the second chapter and you get into the middle of Peter's sermon on Pentecost. And David said, beginning with verse 25, Well, I saw the Lord always before my, me, and He is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. For you have not abandoned my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then you have the repeat of Psalm Psalm 110 verse 1. Over in verse 34, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. When, When I think about When I think about this, we have moved quickly through the pages of time. But we've moved through these pages of time quickly and yet very pointedly that God had a plan to take care of our sin problem. Eve didn't understand it. No doubt the Jews over the years kept asking, well, when's this Messiah coming? When will this be fulfilled? Look at all these good people that we have known. And and they didn't fulfill it. You know what amazes me, brothers and brothers and sisters and friends? The Jews who should have known him couldn't see it. That just amazes me. I guess that is the ultimate of spiritual blindness. Aren't you thankful that you believe it? You can see it. That Jesus came and He lived among us and and He taught and He he did His miracles and and He willingly gave His life and He died and He rose again and He sits at God's own right hand. Why is this powerful for us? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 and 18 and listen to what Jesus says to John as we see this last book of our New Testaments. When I saw him, John said, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, Fear not. Who are you, Lord? I'm the first and the last. The living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. It's so important for us to recognize we talk about the resurrection and there's a lot we could say about that, but ultimately the resurrection means that Jesus is alive and He lives. Matter of fact, He intercedes for us. He's our advocate, 1 John 2 and verse 2. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, I can't see Him, but I can hear Him through Scripture. I believe His promises. Why then did God do all this? Because I had this this great need. You see, Paul said that we're not guilty of Adam's sin, but he says in Romans 5.12 that we all died because we all sinned. God does not want us to be separated from Him. And so He made provision to make it possible for us to be reunited with Him. Not only on this earth, not only here. Jesus says, I'm alive forevermore. But to be with God, the Father, for all eternity. So Paul would say, as he wrote to Timothy His last letter, perhaps the last letter he ever wrote from a prison cell in Rome. He said, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me as prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling. 
not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But He says, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul and listen carefully. Who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now we're going to die physically. It's Hebrews 9 verse 27. It's pointed in the men once to die and after this the judgment. But a person who belongs to Christ is immortal. You will be in the Hadean realm until the judgment and your body will be in the grave some way. But there's a promise of eternal life and the reason the promise is valid is because Jesus fulfilled the promise that God made about the seed of the offspring of woman in Genesis 3.15 through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, can't we live for Him? Can't we live for a living Savior who ever lives to intercede for us? What a wonderful thought and and plan that God had. And it's wonderful when you fill in all the gaps and all the spaces. But He brought life and immortality to light through the Gospel. What is the Gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When a person is baptized into Christ, they're baptized into His death, Romans 6 and verse 3. And Verse 4 says they rise to walk in newness of life. And you know, if we're faithful, because Jesus is alive, if we're faithful, we'll receive a crown of life. And nobody can take it away. Are you living for heaven? Is the promise of heaven your home this morning? If there's some way we can serve you, please come as we stand and Steve leads us.